Hey everyone, and welcome to your favorite YouTube series. Our favorite YouTube series as well, not another demo. I am joined as always by the really bad security crew. We've got the one and only Mr. Aaron Bragg. And then we also have Anthony the Hammer Coggins with me today. Um, and <laughs> and I, I, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Matt, we love not another demo, but it's been a while since we've had some interesting and fun and intelligent sounding accents on this show. And so, I mean, our philosophy is you got to give the people what they want. And so I am thrilled today to introduce um, Alistair Dixon and Gary Penolver. Uh, I told you that would be a very Midwestern way of saying that um, with us from Quad Orbis. And we're going to be talking about um, assets and uh, a lot about assets, right? CMDB. Uh, what, what were some of the other acronyms? I had a bunch of them earlier and I lost it. CCM, Brian, con continuous CCM, controls that's monitoring. the one. Uh, continuous controls monitoring. The premise, guys, with that is we try to get away from the acronym. So if you use one, we'll probably ask you what they mean. Um, if we use one, you're welcome to go right back at us and ask us what they mean. And we'll have some fun with that. But um, Alistair, I'll hand it over to you. The first question we start off with is always really easy. Why would someone, in an era where we're busier than ever, we've got more meetings than ever, why would someone want to carve out 30 minutes or an hour um, to talk with you guys? Uh, besides the fact that you're you know, from the other side of the pond and, and are just fun, fun to talk to because your voices are cool. Well, well, thank you, Matt. It's good to be here. And thank you for your time and the, and the opportunity to, um, yeah, to speak to everyone uh, listening and watching. My name is Arthur Dixon. I'm the commercial director here at... Uh, Cord Orbis, um, been at Cord Orbis for uh, about three years now, but in and around the security and risk area for getting on for probably about over a couple of decades now. So passionate, love the area, feel very fortunate. I kind of stumbled into cybersecurity kind of 20 plus years ago and, and, and risk because it's a, the industry just kind of keeps changing and developing, um, getting more exciting and, and becoming more mainstream and more important to organizations from from. Um, from kind of ground level, we're all the way up to the board. So um, yeah, it's good, 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 good to be speaking to you. Thank you um, from from ourselves. I'll give you a little bit of kind of quad orbis um, while we're here as well. So uh, I'll throw an acronym kind of straight off, but uh, quad orbis offer a continuous controls um, monitoring platform it's known as kind of CCM for an abbreviated uh, for an acronym. Spinning around for probably kind of five or six years or so, but the last. Um, probably kind of 18 months to two years, it's really started to kind of pick up the momentum within the industry as people become more aware of what it does and 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 what it can offer. And as such, we start to see a whole kind of new bunch of vendors coming into the coming into the market. But for those that aren't familiar with continuous controls monitoring, <coughs> effectively for utilizing the tool, it offers you absolute kind of clarity and assurance over how your entire security ecosystem is is performing by connecting direct to every technology source. We can extract out very specific kind of metrics or, or, or and pieces of telemetry to automate those historical, very manual processes to really understand how your kind of cyber metrics, uh, KPIs, KRIs are performing. They can roll up into uh, regulatory compliance, offering that continuous compliance um, approach. Um, and actually, therefore, pull all of those very disparate technologies that people have invested over the years into kind of one single orchestration layer that you can effectively query to understand exactly how anything is performing within your within, within your infrastructure. I suppose the why I hope they'll talk about it to your point. People are very busy um, continuously um, at, at the moment, especially in this kind of hybrid world when people be kind of back to back on, on, on meetings. CCM can save organizations a huge amount of time by automating all those kind of very manual processes while increasing that, uh, that assurance. It can join security, audit, compliance, and, and, and risk teams up by offering them one single kind of source of truth um, over all of the data um, within their organization. And they can all access that to be able to answer the queries that they need to be able to do to do their jobs more efficiently and, and hopefully increase the action of the data they'll be able to use, use with it. So, um, so Gary, I'll, I'll pass it over to you and, and ask kind of a follow-up question as well as introducing yourself of like, so, cause I think this is a really, it's a, it's a hot topic right now, right? It's an important one. It's kind of one we've been talking about for decades now. Um, what sets Quad Orbis apart from your competitors? So hi, um, I'm Gary. I'm the CTO with Quad Orbis. Um, 
as I said, we started the company five or six years ago, um, coming up on six years. Um, took us a couple of years to, to really kind of find our feet in the platform um, and the positioning of it, really. Um, particularly, as I said, there was probably a lot of education we had to do with uh, sort of early on in that a lot of the kind of people we're talking to didn't believe this sort of thing was possible. Um, you know, because a lot of the kind of people we're talking to generally are, are quite literally walking around with clipboards, collecting this information, you know, tapping people on shoulders and really annoying ops people and, you know, all that kind of good stuff. So it kind of took it took a fair bit of education and working with people like Gartner as well, who, who were starting to talk about it already um, before we got the momentum, as, as I mentioned, the last couple of years. And yeah, really why... <clears throat> Why, why quad orbits over one of our competitors? I guess the the kind of main unique selling points fall into a couple of categories, one of which is we talk about any data source. So we don't have pre-built connectors for specific technologies. We don't sort of publish a list of, you know, we only connect to these hundred things that a lot of our competitors talk, you know, sort of talk about. Um, we really focus on that kind of mid to large organizations where they're quite messy. They've got a lot of, you know, a lot of acquisitions, a lot of his historic kind of on-premise on uh, in cloud and private cloud, etc. They're kind of all over the place. And our unique selling point is that we can connect to anything. Um, you know, we've got a low-code, no-code kind of platform that we've built in the back end that we don't expose to customers because we try and make it as simple as possible for them. Um, where we can we can onboard anything really as long as there's some digital telemetry clearly. Um, and that's kind of the other point is the other unique, unique selling point is we deliver it as a service. So it's, there's obviously it's a platform delivered from the cloud fairly, but equally there's a service wrapper that goes with it. We try and take all the complexity that goes with this away from the customers and try and manage all of that for them. So we take what their requirements are, um, work with them on what, what data and what data sources they've got, um, and then work on the kind of results that they want off the other side of it. That's kind of our, our main, main unique selling points really is the fact that we, Try and make it. It's a really complex topic, and we try and make it as simple as possible for customers. Yeah, how I mean, I think sure that. Oh, good. No, so how do you make sure that they're they're covering all of their their assets? So I can see, you know, I can see, you know, a, a world where you're connecting into something like an EDR and vulnerability management and, and things to. To collect that data and make sure you have you have that coverage. Um, how do you go about maybe identifying the gaps or ensuring that everything is covered? Well, obviously the customer needs to be honest with themselves. <laughs> yeah, when we when we're talking to them, which um, which isn't maybe always the case, I guess. Yeah, some some customers might want to hide some pockets of their business from from executive management because they know it's going to be a, a car crash, I guess. But um, but ultimately, you know, we try and work with them to, to connect to as many as uh, data sources that are appropriate. So, you know, you covered you know, some good examples there. It could be things like um, MDM solutions, you know, Intune, et cetera. Um, but equally, you know, NAC solutions, right? You know, so solutions that are picking up what assets are physically connected to the network too, right? Um, anything that presents any kind of asset related data, I mean, we're, we're talking about assets a lot, but and it's probably worth rewinding quickly. So the kind of maturity curve we usually take customers on is we help them understand that they're what we call entities. So it's assets, identities, et cetera. Try and, try and unpick that bit for them and get them some good, solid um, uh, ground that you can kind of, we can build upon from there. Um, so getting them confident in the, the asset list, et cetera, and the coverage that we can then show them you know, how, how good, how good or, or not they're looking. And then we kind of work into the kind of KPI, KRI. So, you know, what controls, metrics are appropriate for mitigating ransomware, for example, um, and help, help helps kind of automate the kind of monitoring of those controls and then work into sort of the much more mature use cases around compliance and, you know, sort of regulatory kind of aspects. Yeah, well, I guess that the... leads me into Sorry, what the next ahead, question Angie. was, which is what what's the deliverable or kind of output of, so, you know, connected, I've connected all the things, right? You've got all my network telemetry data. You've got, um, you know, my EDR, my vulnerability management, my MDM. Um, what, what, what is all of that coalescing together then present to the customer for them to, to use or improve on? Um, there's probably a couple of different 
versions of reality of that. Uh, one, one is that the, the platform that we deliver has dashboards, they can log into it, they can visualize all that through um, um, through sort of very operational dashboards, you know, for control owners, et cetera, all the way up to, you know, board level kind of reporting that, that kind of makes it quite simplistic, but it's based off of the same data. Um, the other answer to that is, I guess, is that we can bring platforms like G GRC platforms and things like that to life, right? So we can actually start attesting the state of their controls in those GRC platforms. So where they're, they're to date probably manually completing 100% of the controls they're attesting in their GRC platform, well, depending on their level of maturity, we can probably get them to 70, 80% of that is being automated, the attestation of it. Um, the other version of reality is partners that are um, delivering their own kind of platforms that are being fed by us. So other sort of risk management platforms that focus on executive board reporting that we do all of the kind of data plumbing for and control calculation for and then push into those kind of platforms as well. Does that Along those lines, what, um, what are you using to feed the data? You, you don't have, do you have like hardware on it? Are you doing an API based? Like what kind of, what kind of connection points you have? And you also earn points with me because you didn't use the term single pane of glass. You're going to get docked a couple cool points if you use single pane of glass. So thank yeah. you for not saying that. <laughs> we, ha we have, however, heard KPI and KRI a couple of times. So if somebody oh. could throw out the answer to that one, um, that would be great as well. Yeah, good point. Sorry. Um, <laughs> KRI, key risk indicators, um, and KPI, key performance indicators. Now you so can go back to using the acronym. You only have to explain yeah. it once. That's how that works. Um. Sorry, Aaron, I'm trying to remember your questions that you just, you just I, posed. I throw it off. Matt it's messed it up. No, yeah. how are you, how are you, how are you feeding this data feeding into feeding your it. solution? Yeah, okay. So, so we, we spin up a dedicated environment per customer in AWS by default. So they can, anywhere that AWS supports, we support. Um, so if you want your, your environment to be in East Coast, US, that's, that we'd use one of the regions, we'd use one of the AWS regions there. Um, so anywhere they support, we, we stand it up. Within that environment, we can connect to any cloud-based data sources you have. So that can, you know, once you provided us API keys, we can connect to any of those, those data sources. For any private data sources you have in your private cloud and in you know, data centers, et cetera, there's a virtual appliance that you can deploy within your environment. Um, and this isn't a seam solution. It's probably worth you know, a security monitoring, you know, security event monitoring type tool. Um, so this isn't a sort of a needle in the haystack type tool where you're pushing lots of data in. This is about us pulling interesting information from the data sources you have. And that, that doesn't have to be just be APIs, although 99% of what we pull is from APIs. It can be from databases. It can be from file systems. It can be from email. You know, we can automate stuff out of email and things like that as well, but it doesn't really matter. As long as there's some telemetry and we can, it can be processed and you know, as long as we can put some logic over the top of the data um, that makes sense to come up with a calculation that means something to you guys. Can you guys connect to Active Directory? Yeah. Yeah. But from our guys... perspective, the, the more yes. technologies that we have the ability or the ability that we that we connect to within our within our clients, then the richer viewpoint we can offer them on the high level of assurance. Um, Anthony, to your original question that we are covering absolutely every technology, every asset, every identity, at that point, from our perspective, that's where we have the confidence that what we're presenting to the clients um, via their by their dashboards actually is covering absolutely everything across their network that they that they that they wish to be able to be able to kind of visualize and 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 run those kind of metrics, run those metrics again. So from our perspective, because because we can connect to anything, obviously we we encourage to be able to kind of connect to anything, but actually the output of that is actually we can be more assured that we are um that we've got complete coverage across across their networks. Well, where I was going with that is, is what, if, what happens when you have a company that's not as mature, like in their data governance and stuff like that, right? So we're going to feed you a whole bunch of information, but we're not mature enough to be able to identify. So this feels like, again, this is not a good thing or bad thing. I'm just trying to get my head around your product is that this isn't so much discovery no. Right. In the sense where you're going out, you're seeing, you know, you're going out and seeing what's on your network. 
your post, this is a more mature, a mature program kind of thing where, hey, do you want to start coalescing your data? Do you want to start doing more with it and taking action on it? Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I think so. I think I think that's that's quite a good quite a good distinction in the sense that you know we're not actively discovering, right? We're not we're not scanning networks or anything like that. This is about taking the data from the tooling you've got. It doesn't matter what that tooling might be, you know, as as, uh, as we sort of touched upon and Anthony mentioned some of them before. Um, it can be anything from NAC solutions to uh, you know network solutions to um, um, cloud based EDRs and, and whatever else. It doesn't really matter. Whatever data sources you have, we bring that together and we dedupe it. We look at kind of, you know, how can we match those assets together to give you that confidence that, you know, your EDR tool is telling you that you've got 100 systems on your network. Um, it only knows about what it knows about. So it thinks it's got 100% coverage. But actually, when you augment that with all the other tooling you've got, maybe there's another 30 systems actually that should have EDR on them. So you're helping to kind of kind of pinpoint that kind of coverage. But, it's, but you're absolutely right. It's based on the data you've got. Um, and you're absolutely right, you know, from a maturity perspective, sometimes the quality of that data isn't great. You know, um, you know, people haven't tagged it. They haven't, they haven't got, you know, sort of naming conventions that make any sense or, or something that we can use to kind of pivot on. And generally, you know, that's why I sort of talked about that kind of maturity curve that we take customers on generally, starting with what we call entities or so assets, identities, et cetera. Um, starting with that and helping them nail that piece because like i say it's the bedrock for everything else and then moving on to the kris then moving on to compliance because if you kind of start on the compliance piece it's it just opens up so many more questions and the quality of data can be in a completely different state and so it really is kind of taking people on that journey of of um helping them to to mature their data sometimes too so what what fields are you typically gathering from these assets. So, you know, if I connect you to, we'll just keep using the EDR, if I connect you to our EDR solution, are you pulling like just the asset name? Like, are you doing asset name, OS, like, you know, the processor type, like a, like what, what of all the things that are being connected and fed, what is actually being cataloged and um, sort of analyzed to get these views and dashboards that that you've talked about all of the above right i mean it, i mean it's you know the mac address the ip address the, what, what location it might be you know any kind of unique identifiers that that tooling might even give it as well um so all of that information we take all of that um we um we match it uh, based on other data sources based on some of those attributes and it's kind of based on confidence levels and things like that right you know so if something matches on you know mac address plus uh plus a DNS name, a fully qualified DNS name, it's going to be a pretty good match probably. You know, um, you've got your unique hardware identifier there and, and, a, and a you know fully qualified domain name. So it's based on kind of confidence levels on, on all the different attributes we capture. And then we chuck it all into a graph and that's what kind of then marries up everything, you know, in terms of what users are logging into which systems, et cetera. Awesome. And then once it all is in the, in the system, is is the customer able to kind of slice and dice the data how how they would like? So if we're, for instance, if I'm feeding in all of my all of my assets, but I want risk views based on vertical or by region or by business unit, am I able to get to that level and kind of slice and dice yeah. you know, to what we want to see? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, ca I'll caveat that with exactly the point you made before, right, which is the quality of the data, right? So is is there some attributes within all that data that we've captured that allows us to slice it by business unit or by by country or whatnot? So so yes is the answer, as long as that data exists somewhere. Um, and usually it does, right? I mean, if you think of, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I've never once yet come across an organization that's got a complete CMDB, no, not once. Um, but it's a good starting point usually, you know, it's a good starting point where people have started to at least, they've started with the right intentions within the CMDB. Um, so there's some good stuff in there um, that can be pulled in and can be used as one of the data sources, right? You know, we talk about EDR and all these, but actually the CMDB is also a data source that we should be using, that we use typically, sorry. Um, and interestingly, you know, quite often we'll do a, almost a reverse coverage metric against the, the CMDB to show the CMDB team what's missing from it as well to kind of help help them to, to kind of make it, the CMDB itself more robust. 
Um, yeah. So that, then, where, then, I, so that was like, where I was going to go. Oh, yeah. So that, that information can go both ways, right? Like you can help. Correct. And is that content management database? Is that, am I getting that? Is that right? I don't, I don't actually know what CMDB stands for. that content. You were, you were almost there. Oh it's man, like, so close. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think, you know, having kind of grown up through infrastructure myself, um, that was the, like the Holy grail forever. I right? like we, I I've seen so many of them spin up and die because they're out of date the second that they're, you know, that they're published. So is that part of this is, Hey, we're gathering all of this information. Yeah. We can pull stuff from your CMDB, but we're, but we're also pushing good information back up so that it's making that actually have some value for the company. Exactly. Yeah, exactly that. So then let's talk a little bit about some of the other business values. Maybe there's some folks that are kind of kind of new to this space or trying to understand some of what we're talking about. So I'm gathering all of this information off of my endpoints. What value does that provide the company? Or I'm getting all this information off of this network here. Um, like outside of just collecting the data, like what's what's the value there? In the entire solution or just purely the asset piece or both? Let's do both. I like Let's both. See. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So um the asset piece, I think, is is as I say, it's, it's the bedrock for everything else, right? So so understanding are my key controls, and those key controls might be things like have I got EDR, um, you know, some sort of um endpoint defense technology on all of my laptops desktops all my end users and, and even my production systems have i got that in place because it's such a key control um for example um is it on all of the systems because it only takes one user that doesn't have it installed or it's not installed properly or it's ineffective or whatnot clicking on a phishing link and you've you've kind of opened the door there potentially to, to kind of risk so so the, the the point we're trying to resolve with the with the coverage piece, so with the asset piece from our part, is to solve that coverage question. Key controls like EDR are they on all the systems they should be? Um, because otherwise, having you know kind of all this APT defense technology, all the money you're spending on all these tools, if it's if key controls you're expecting to be in place aren't actually in place, then you're kind of you know, you're it's the basics, right? It's about doing the basics properly, and that kind of coverage question is is, is part of that, I think, really. So can well, that dive farther exactly. into like other applications that you want to have everywhere as well? Like we want like Office or some other. Uh, you could certainly do Office and things whatever like that. Whatever you're, yeah. Or what, yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay. I don't think any customers are, by the way, but you know, in terms of. Yeah, like, I said that and then I aged myself real quickly because no one does it anymore. <laughs> so. um, but yeah, key, kind of key security controls. And we keep talking about security and and, and such, but it's not always security controls that we're we're helping people to. To, to, to protect against it can be sort of wider IT risk um, uh, and operational controls too. Um, but that is our sweet spot, you know, that, that kind of that, that, that cyber risk kind of point and the, and the kind of security related controls. Sorry, Al, did you want to chip in with something there? Well, I was going to say, as part of the overall kind of value of the solution, I think when security was kind of perceived as almost a kind of, kind of you know, kind of dark art and we kind of sat in our, <clears throat> sat in our kind of bunker downstairs then actually it, it, it was fine. We didn't have quite as many tools and the teams will work together to understand how the technologies were, were performing. Now there is a greater expectation that's driven both from, um, and hopefully most organizations from the board level down or certainly from a kind of regulatory compliance or framework perspective, there is a greater, I suppose, focus and need or requirement to have absolute clarity about how those KPIs are performing, how those controls, those metrics are performing. And actually, if you are going to be presenting that information either to an external auditor, regulator, or particularly your board, you need to be giving them very accurate information. You also need to be presenting them kind of trending information so they can see how the investments that they've been making are, are performing, how they're, how they're affecting their overall kind of cyber resilience and increasing their kind of overall security security posture. That helps drive more, in, more investment because they can understand kind of what value they're getting from it. <clears throat> but mostly they can just have the confidence that actually the the really, really dedicated for the most part and, and highly skilled kind of security folks within the organization are delivering on what they are saying they are doing and they're doing everything they can to kind of keep that organization's reputation and data secure and safe. So I think that's probably one of the bigger changes that's happened is those kind of external requirements outside of the security team have led the need to be able to um, have the kind of the, the greater visibility over them. And I think that's where the, our CMBD conversation came from is, 
because security teams didn't have the confidence maybe that the CMBD were using that information in a, in a kind of secure way, they've kind of gone, right, we've got to find a better way of doing this ourselves. So we've seen that whole kind of asset management um, space kind of grow significantly in the, last, in the last couple of years. Our point as a CCM been doing that is having that asset intelligence is critical, really important. What you do with that intelligence actually is where it becomes really valuable. And that is where you can start to align it to different controls and metrics and those types of things. And actually that's where it becomes part of an overall solution. And that's where it, it adds real value to the organization across the board. Yeah. And, it's, and, it, and just to drop another acronym in there. So, so <laughs> as, 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 as I said, you know, sort of in the last couple of years, you know, you've got Gartner that have kind of coined this phrase of chasm of cyber asset attack surface management. A mouthful. Um, and they, you know, they and they kind of coin these phases, you know, like um, um, CSPM for um, cloud security posture management for your, your, your infrastructure and services and SSPM for SaaS security posture management, kind of coining all these phrases. Um, and that kind of chasm one was obviously driven very much out of, of, of exactly that frustration, right, that the security teams find with CMDBs. Um, and, and equally, you know, these these other acronyms I just, just mentioned, you know, they're they're all they're they're just all part of that journey that that we think is part of CCM, right? You know, so at solving the asset part is is stage one of sol of understanding your controls and your controls effectiveness. So hence why we're not a point solution just to do the asset part, the, the chasm part. We're actually solving the asset part because you need that in order to solve your controls monitoring and be able to do controls monitoring properly. Whether that's for you know compliance or actually just purely because you know you're getting more asked more questions by the board about how we're we doing, right? How are we more or less susceptible to ransomware or whatever that that kind of those those kind of key risks might be for your organization and the controls you might. So it might those controls might not just be around assets, they can be around are our backups effective? Are we testing them, right? You know, are, we, are we monitoring that? Are we, are we testing that? So, so to that point, you're talking where you could tie, you said you you had the ability to tie into GRC governance, risk and compliance monitoring, right? Because then that ideal state, you get in there, you get some of those, you tie into your tool, right? And then you send, you know, basically send to-do lists, right? go do this, take care of this. And if you don't do it by X amount of time, then, you know, then you're dealing with compliance. Are you starting to see more companies ask for this part? And the reason why I say that is because in the last two months, <laughs> well, I guess ever since, more so since change healthcare incident, um, companies are asking deeper questions. And I don't even mean all the cyber liability insurance that Anthony has us answer from years past. Now it is like individual third parties that we work with are asking, are you doing this with your secure software development life cycle? Are you doing this with your vulnerability management passing? Whereas, you know, usually we've had to ask those questions. So does that one of the powers of your tool is it can tie nicely into that? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Agreed. So um, also kind of links in, we did an interesting piece with um, Liberty Global Markets, a white paper last summer, talking about how um, the area of kind of continuous controls monitoring should be a, a significant advantage in the cyber insurance market. The reality is that being able to demonstrate not only have you got those controls in place, but they're effective and they're becoming more effective over the period of time from, a, from an insurance perspective, enables them to much better assess the risk and therefore the kind of costs and what should be covered in that policy. But from our perspective, from a client perspective, their ability to demonstrate that not only have they bought the right tools, but they've implemented the right tools, they've installed them, they're running the right areas and they're monitoring to make sure they're getting the absolute most value out of those tools, means that they, when they're going to those, 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 those insurers, they can actually kind of go, right, actually, we know what we're doing and we can demonstrate it to you on a continuous basis. So our, our risk to you is kind of slightly lower. And it's 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 all what we were evaluating, discussing in this white paper that for kind of black boxes for cars, I think you probably guys in the US, we get a little... Um, I suppose a little kind of tracker in the car and you can track how fast someone's driving, how fast going around corners, all those things. You can have a more of a kind of dynamic insurance model. Um, and actually even health insurance on the kind of, you know, on the on the on the Fitbits on the wrist. Actually, from a technology perspective within an industry around insurance, which is which is, you know, cyber insurance is an area that's probably needs a it's a bit of a chaotic area, I suppose, at the moment. 
CCM's got a great solution for that. But that use case can be used around your third-party suppliers, as we just covered as well. So actually being able to take that information and, and use it not internally within your organization, but also external organizations, be it suppliers or insurers, can be very valuable, useful information. And if you can automate that whole process while doing it, well, actually, you are, you're, in, you're in a great spot. You're saving yourselves a lot of time while hopefully helping out your, 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 your business. So tell me if this is an oversimplification, but something just kind of clicked, um, or you know, for me, and that's it seems like you're taking the the spirit of CSPM for what is only specifically looking at cloud and extending what those capabilities are to all of your assets. So to any type of control, yeah, really, yeah. yeah. Um, and that, and when we talk about control, that can be control in the traditional sense of, you know, PCI or NIST or whatever the framework might be, or SOX, a control listed in one of those kind of frameworks, or a control you've defined yourself uh, within the organisation, um, uh, or um, or or what what you know people like you and I might kind of refer to as metrics, right? You know, kind of kind of key metrics that show things are you know, moving in the right direction, like like we mentioned, sort of KPI, KRI type things. So, I mean, it's um, it really is helping to demonstrate that. And you know, the I guess the the kind of the, the far end of the spectrum is 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 the compliance piece that we mentioned there, which is around you know reducing that pre audit scramble that everyone goes through every year when you're about to be audited. Uh, for whatever framework it might be, you know, three months before you've got a whole team of people that are running around trying to make sure controls haven't been broken for the last four months. Um, and when the auditor asks you to see that one date, that one one control of that one date, that it actually was effective, that you can do that. Um, and equally, it's that kind of reducing that burden on the, like I say, the infrastructure, the control operators, right? The people that are actually doing the work that I've got to then give all this information to the assurance teams that actually that bit is just all taken out, right? We are automating as much of that as possible. Um, and whether that's just being pushed into the GRC team and that, sorry, it's the GRC tooling and that's where it's being used or just through our dashboarding, right? Like I say, it's kind of appeals to kind of both ends of the spectrum, control operators and, you know, very operational up to kind of board level. So where do you, do you see a lot of these products? We, we've kind of, we've talked about security and infrastructure and business and GRC. Where do you see these types of products being driven out of? Like, who are, the, who are the folks you're normally talking to? Is this a security initiative or are you finding it coming from the GRC team or where, where, what's, what is the big drivers for this right now? Or is it all of the above? It's all of the above really. Yeah. All of the above, yeah. One of, the, one of the beautiful things I always say about CCM is it kind of works across kind of security, compliance, risk, and, and, and audit, and pulls all those two teams together. Actually, one of the big challenges with kind of CCM is, is, is it goes across security, risk, compliance, and audit. So understanding who the kind of key um, owner of that area is with an organization is kind of really key. But uh, the, what traditionally kind of happens to Gary's point over that kind of going on that journey is we more often than not start within the kind of security teams because they're, they're lacking some level of visibility or, or they've got too many processes they're kind of manually doing. So we'll start there, get on board. And actually, once we find we're kind of working with the client, actually at that point, then it starts to kind of expand out because the data is in there. So actually throwing some kind of compliance or frameworks for them to be able to monitor is quite straightforward, throwing some risks in there or audit in there. So actually it just kind of expands out. So tend to kind of pick a small use case you know, uh, demonstrate the value you're getting from it. And, and hopefully you kind of get that further buying and motivation and then you can expand it out. But I would say the kind of security team and um, security oversight tends to be by far the kind of larger um, area of kind of interest, I suppose, to start off with. But, but interestingly, yeah. more recently, we've had, um, you know, head of head of cloud, uh, head of head of DevOps, those kind of people approach us and actually buy our, buy our platform because, you know, as them, as they're adopting very cloud agile approaches, processes, putting things into the cloud and automating as much as possible. And then look within these large organizations and they're, and they're being asked by very traditional GRC teams to you know, provide the evidence for, for all these things. They don't want to take very traditional approaches of collecting this information to provide to the GRC team. So actually, conversely, the control operators are starting to buy it because actually they want to make their lives easier. They're not collecting all of this stuff manually to be able to provide it to the assurance teams in the first place. Yeah. Well, there's your cost benefit, right? 
the the amount of time to go into each visual that you know in the dashboard like aws run those those reports jump over to azure you know run those reports your on-prem stuff you guys could you guys have the ability to collate that data and then you're doing it from that one point you exactly. know and doing those reports in a manner that obviously your auditing team is going to love <laughs> Exactly. It's probably more of a point for brands near our kind of query, but we always get the perception that because everyone does a little bit in those types of in those types of environments, it's it's hard for a business to kind of go, actually that that is the cost of compliance because it's it's you know it's 10 minutes here and it's five minutes here across you know teams and teams of people. Um actually the overall savings can be huge, but I don't think they're often understood because the cost, the true cost of compliance, is very hard to be able to understand for organisations just by the very kind of the nature of how it's been done over the over the previous period of time. Yeah, a hundred percent agree. Mm -hmm. Well, fellas, I learned something today. Um, I learned that uh, companies have assets of all kinds all over the place, and they are probably completely and totally out of control. So, if you are interested in getting some continuous controls uh, over your assets. You should probably talk with our friends here at Quad Orbis. Um, so Gary, Alistair, thank you guys. I know it's late for y'all over on that side of the pond, so we appreciate you hanging with us and being a part of this. Um, fantastic episode, as I knew it would be. So thank you very much. And we will see all, oh, like, subscribe, do all that corny stuff as well. And uh, we'll see you all for episode 42. Thanks, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.